Hello and welcome to the latest in a series of videos in which I've been building experiments from Charles Platt's Introduction to Electronics, Make Electronics. Uh, the third edition is the one that I'm using. If you watched the previous episode, you'll know that in that experiment, the book started to introduce us to the fascinating relationship between an electric current and a magnetic field. And indeed, we used a coil of wire around a metal core, which in my case was a large Allen key, to induce a magnetic field in that core. Well, in this experiment, we're going to look at the converse situation, which is how can we use a moving magnetic field to generate an electric current in a coil of wire? So obviously to do that, we need to start with a coil. And whereas in the previous experiment, we were wrapping the wire around that metal core, for this experiment, we need a hollow former. And the book suggests that you use a short length of PVC pipe like this. Uh, so I've acquired just such a thing. Now, uh, the coil itself will be formed from hookup wire. So I've got a couple of reels of 100 foot uh, hookup wire here, uh, which will connect together to create a 200 foot uh, length in total. So yes, we do need a lot of wire for this to work. The other thing is that in the previous experiment, the wire was just loosely wrapped uh, around the uh, Allen key with nothing to really retain it. So it was a little bit messy and spread out, uh, which worked fine for the purposes of that experiment. But for this one to work, we need that coil of wire to be fairly tightly contained um, in a short space on the pipe, about three centimeters or a little over an inch. So to do that, the book suggests that you obtain a couple of plywood discs um, and drill the center out to accommodate the pipe. Now, I didn't have those sort of materials available. So instead, what I opted to do was to 3D print this. And no, contrary to uh, appearances, this is not a spare wheel for the world's smallest wagon. The idea is that it will just slide onto one end of the pipe like so. The spokes will then retain the wire as it's wrapped round. Uh, and then you see it's got a bit of a flange on it so that I can duct tape it securely to the pipe. I did... Uh, have an earlier attempt to print one for the other side, which I am going to use, but uh, it was basically a less successful design. Um, so I learned my lesson from this one and uh, uh, and came up with a better design for this one. Um, <clears throat> so this one is a bit flimsier, which is why I've reinforced it with a bit of duct tape, but it, it'll still do the job. So I'm going to use that for the other side. So what I'll do now is I'll assemble the parts of my former and then we can start winding the coil. So here's the completed former uh, and you can see what I've done is I've just stripped one end of one of the spools and I've run it through uh, the spokes uh, on this wheel uh, and just taped it into place to hold it securely so that now I can start to make my turns around the pipe. So what I'll do now is I'll carry on doing that until I get to the end of the first spool uh, and then I'll come back and uh, show you where I'm up to. So I've wound on the first spool of hookup wire and I've stripped the other end here. Uh, so now I need to join that to the second spool so that I can continue winding. But before I do that, I'm just going to do a quick continuity check. Now, this was a new spool of wire, so there shouldn't be any issue, but I'd rather know now if there is than after I've wound on another 100 foot. So let me just connect up the multimeter. That's set to continuity mode. So now all being well, that's great. So we've got continuity there. So now it should be safe for me to uh, carry on with the next spool. Now the author says that there's not really any necessity to solder the spools together if you're using multiple spools of, of wire. Um, so I'm going to take him at his word. 
<laughs> and uh, let's see how we get on. So what I'm going to do is just uh, basically twist the wires together just so that we've got a good connection. And then let's just get that round the other way. And then I will just apply a little bit of electrical tape just to stop that from coming apart. Make sure that that join is completely covered. That should do. Let's just snip that off there. Okay. So now I'm going to just continue winding uh, to get the second spool of wire on there. So here's the finished coil. And as you can see, I've just bought the other end of the wire back out through the spokes uh, and just secured it in place with a bit of tape. Uh, I have done another continuity check just to make sure everything's okay and it is, which is great. So the next question then is now we've got our coil, how do we get a magnetic field moving through this coil? Well, the answer to that is a piece of downing rod, which I can use as a handle. And to the end of that, I will attach one of these. And I know this looks like a single magnet stuck through a bit of cardboard, but actually uh, it is two uh, separate magnets, uh, one about twice the length of the other. Now these things are incredibly strong. And so the book does warn you, if they are close to another magnet or to a piece of metal, then they will close the gap at incredible speed and there are two potential issues with that. One is that although these seem rock solid, they are quite brittle, so they can shatter if they hit too hard. And the other thing is that if a bit of your flesh happens to be between the magnet where it's trying to get to, then ouch, you definitely don't want to experience that. So it is well worth taking a bit of care with them. So what I will do now um, is attach one of these to the end of the downing rod. Now the book suggests the way to do this is to insert a flathead screw into one end of the dowling rod and then use that to hold the magnet in place. Um, I'm going to opt to just tape the magnet onto the end of the rod and see how I got on with that. Uh, and I'll start with the smaller one and we'll see what sort of result we get from that before maybe trying the larger magnet. So I've connected the terminals of the coil up to the multimeter and you'll notice that I've got it set to measure AC voltage rather than DC voltage and that's quite an important factor because the way this will work is when I slide the magnet through as it goes through in one direction it will generate current in one direction and as it comes back through the coil it will generate current in the opposite direction so when that motion is repeated then it will generate an alternating current. So let me power up the multimeter. You can see we're getting a nominally small uh, reading, but as I start to move the magnet through, you can see that average voltage is increasing. Um, and actually you need to get up a fair speed to get any appreciable voltage. So you can see that, whoops, <laughs> even doing it quite rapidly, I'm still only getting up to about a quarter of a volt, which is nothing. So um, we're not really not generating very much power at all with this small magnet. So what I think I'll do is just try a different tactic. So what I've done <coughs> is I've inserted a wedge of cardboard in one end of the pipe. Uh, in this long uh, handle part here just to limit the movement and I'm now going to just insert the larger magnet loose into the pipe 
and then I'm going to close off this end as well with a bit of tape just to make sure that it can't get out and now what I'm going to try doing with it and see if this gets me any better results is basically shake it like a maraca and already that's an improvement I'm getting a little over half a volt now uh, it's still not a great amount of power but it's significantly better than what I was getting now the question is can I generate enough power to light an LED and the answer to that question sadly is no <laughs> half a volt is just not sufficient to overcome the minimum forward voltage requirements of most LEDs. Now, I think there are a couple of problems that are resulting in a rather inadequate performance from this setup. One of these is the size of this central core. This PVC pipe that I've used is just a little bit too roomy. And if you, uh, if you look at the diameter of it compared to the size of the magnet that I'm using there's just way too much room for it to be rattling around in there so it will still work and you've seen that it does still work it does still generate some voltage but not sufficient because at any one point where the magnet is there's going to be a reasonably large gap between the side of the magnet and one side of the uh, coil so that's not great so what I've done to correct that is basically 3d printed a new core and as you can see this one is a much more snug fit for the magnet it's still loose enough that the magnet will slide around freely uh, but it's a lot tighter fit than the previous one so that solves that problem uh, and then of course I've reprinted my wagon wheels so that they fit onto this resized core. The second issue is while you can use ordinary hookup wire like this for uh, creating the coil, it's not ideal because it is covered in plastic insulation. And so in the case of this type of wire, that means that about 50% of the space in the interior of the coil is going to be taken up with a non-conductive material. Um, and that is going to result in a much lower efficiency. So the solution to that is to replace it with this. And this is sometimes known as magnet wire, but it's basically a wire that rather than having a plastic insulation has a very thin enamel coating to insulate it and the great thing about this is that because the insulation is very thin is when it's in a coil most of the area in the interior of the coil is conductor rather than insulation so that's going to make it much more effective than using the hookup wire which we were earlier and the one downside to this wire is that you can't use normal wire strippers to take the insulation off because it is an enamel coating. You have to basically scrape it off using something like a bit of sandpaper um, to just expose the conductor at one end of the wire. So, okay, let me build the coil Mark II now and see how we got on with that. Okay, so here's coil Mark II. Uh, I already have it connected to the multimeter, which is set to measure AC volts. Um, I have checked continuity, so I know that the coil is fine. So let's see whether we can get any improvement on the type of voltage we can record with this version. So I'm popping the magnet into the interior. And wow. That is a significant improvement there. Look, we're getting between one and two volts, depending on which way the magnet's going. But that is significantly higher than we were getting before. So that is great. So now the next thing is to see whether that is indeed enough to light an LED. 
Okay, so my coil is now connected to an LED. It's just an ordinary red LED, nothing special about it at all. Uh, and what I will do is uh, just turn off the lights just so that you can see what's happening with it clearly. So it's going to go dark for a moment. Uh, you might not be able to see, but I'm just picking up the coil now, and now I'm going to start moving the magnet back and forth. And as you can see, the LED is flashing on and off. Why is it flashing and not continuous? Um, I mean, you might expect a bit of pulsing because of the, um, because we saw on the multimeter that the voltage varies, um, but surely it shouldn't go out completely. Well, the reason is, of course, is because what we're generating here is AC voltage and that means that for half the cycle the current is going the wrong way through the LED. Uh, fortunately it's not high enough to burn the LED out but it does mean that the LED is not going to light when the current is going in one direction which is why we get this blinking effect. So there we go. That is coil mark 2. <laughs> Minus magnet now, being very successful in lighting an LED. Well, that was a fascinating experiment to carry out, just to see how much mechanical energy is needed just to generate a fairly small electric current. And this principle of generating electricity through electromagnetic induction is still what is used today to deliver much of our requirement for power, whether that be, for example, through a steam turbine in a power station driving a generator, or perhaps a wind turbine in a wind farm driving a generator. And of course, these devices work at a much larger scale with much higher voltages and currents, but fundamentally, the principle is still the same. So I do hope that you found it interesting to see how that works on a smaller scale. Now, in the next episode, the book continues our exploration of this topic and starts to look at other applications of it other than power generation, starting with the humble loudspeaker. So please do join me for that.